بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم بارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my brothers my sisters in Islam there was a great scholar of Islam by the name of Ibn Abi Dunya رحمه الله who used to say that in my life I will never ever give tazkiyah to anyone. Tazkiyah means to affirm the uprightness or righteousness of any human being. So he used to say, when people used to ask him, would you give tazkiyah about so-and-so? Do you think so-and-so is a good person to get married to? Do you think so-and-so is a good person to do business with? We, are, we get asked that question all the time, don't we? Ibn Abid Dunya used to say, I will never ever give tazkiyah to any single person. Why? Because he said, for what I have read from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the heart of a believer. You see, ikhwati, the heart of a believer is very fragile. The heart of a believer is very weak. مَا سُمِّيَ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَّا لِنَسِعِهِ وَلَا الْقَلْبُ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يَتَقَلَّبُ Mankind was not called man except because he forgets a lot. And the heart was not called the heart except that it moves around, twists around, turns. Today it's positive, tomorrow negative. Today likes something, tomorrow hates it. Today he thinks something is good, tomorrow he thinks that same thing is bad. Today he goes to sleep as a Muslim, tomorrow he wakes up as a, as a disbeliever. Ya khwati, this is the heart of people. And it's for this reason why Ibn Abid Dunya used to say, I will never give tazkiyah to anyone alive. I will only give tazkiyah to those who are dead. My brothers and sisters of Islam, such is the heart of a person today. We have hearts that are flimsy and fragile. We have hearts that turn and twist. We have hearts that need a lot of stability and thabat. And it is precisely for this reason why, ikhwati, my brothers and sisters of Islam, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the month of Ramadan. The month where the hearts have a madrasa and a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, there are certain things that destroy the heart. From those things destroy the heart, indeed, is luxury and wealth. The fact that there's so much dunya around us makes the hearts very, very hard. And the funny thing about being completely oblivious of the akhirah, being engulfed by the dunya, is that our hearts become so hard, we tend not to even fear Allah Azza In fact, in the authentic, in the, in the verse in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hadid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, what does he say? He said, أَلَمْ يَأْنِنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَى قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Has the time not come for those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for their hearts to tremble when Allah's words are mentioned? وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلُ And do not be like those people who were given the book beforehand. And so a long duration of time before, passed away before they actually read the book. And many of them became wrongdoers. It is for this reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the month of Ramadan. Those people, their hearts became hard because they forgot to read the book of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the month of Quran, Ramadan, in order to fix the hearts that have become hard over the years. My brothers and sisters of Islam, how many brothers did Yusuf have? Yusuf والسلام, had 11 brothers and he was the 12th one. Yeah, 11 brothers, he was the 12th one. Do you not see how he saw in his dream that the sun and the moon and 11 stars were prostrating to him? He had 11 brothers. In the same way, ikhwati, we have 11 months. But Yusuf was the special one. He was the one when, when, he, when he went missing, Yaqub lost his eyesight. In the same way, ikhwati, when we lose Ramadan, we destroy our relationship with Allah, we destroy our hearts. We lose something in our heart, in, our, in ourselves, that can never be replaced with anything else but by finding Yusuf again. So, ikhwati, walhamdulillah, glory be to Allah that He has given us the Yusuf of the months of the year, and that is Ramadan, the most beautiful time in this dunya. It is the time of mercy it is a time of victory the greatest battles of islam were fought in the month of ramadan the battle of Batr fought on the 17th of ramadan the battle of fath makkah 
the battle over uh, Andalus, the battle of Mut'a, the battle over the Mongols and Tatars, where the Muslims destroyed them in Hittin, was all fought in the month of Ramadan, the month of victory over Shaitan, when Shaitan is chained up, the month of victory over ourselves, ya khwati, the greatest enemy of all, the person in the mirror. My brothers and sisters of Islam, this month is so special that the scholars of Islam used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the scholars from the Sahaba and the scholars from the Salaf used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for six months before Ramadan to bring them to Ramadan. And after Ramadan, by six months, they used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the ibadah that they had made in that month. The month of Ramadan was so special, ikhwati, my brothers and sisters in Islam, that the Sahaba used to wait on that month and do an act of ibadah. The Salaf of Salih used to do acts of ibadah that they never used to do in any other month. It was reported that Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he used to read the Quran 60 times in Ramadan, 60 times. On the day, he would read it, all of it. And at night, he would read it all again, but in Salah. So Ikhwati, 60 times you recite the whole of the Quran. And lest you think it's not possible, this is some sort of exaggeration. I still remember reading in, the, in our books about a sheikh, a scholar by the name of Bakr Abu Zaid who passed away many years ago when he mentions that I read the hadith where, where it was reported that Uthman used to recite the whole Quran at night completely. And I said to my sheikh, which is Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti, I said, sheikh, it's probably an exaggeration. Someone's exaggerating. He said, why not test it? So they decided to test whether it's possible to recite the whole Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. So they started right after Isha, right now, like this time now. And they said, Allahu Akbar, Fatiha then, they started with Surah Al-Baqarah. He said, I swear by Allah, this is in Medina. He said, I swear by Allah, the Adhan of Fajr was going off and the Shaykh was reciting, Qul A'udhu Rabbin Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas. My brothers and sisters in Islam, it is possible to recite the whole Qur'an at night. And it is for this reason why the scholars of the past used to excel in the month of Ramadan, the month of the Quran. It was reported that Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah, it was reported that Imam Malik rahimahullah. In the days outside of Ramadan, he would have the books of fiqh open. But in the days of Ramadan, he would close the books of fiqh and he would open the books of the Quran. My brothers and sisters of Islam, it is the month of remembering those people that are the most insignificant or those who are considered insignificant in society. Those people who are the lowest in the rungs of the ladder of society. They are the poor and the prisoners. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remember the poorest of people. As a result, he said, and he ordered us to stay away from eating. Because one of the best ways to understand what they go through is to go through what they go through every day. Do you know how many people today Today, or even today, right now, like, like this day of 29th of May, 2014, how many people are actually chronically hungry? Chronic hunger means no food to eat except one meal a day, sometimes less than one meal. Your gastric emptying time, the amount of time that your food stays in your tummy is four hours. There is no less than 1.2 billion human beings that are chronically hungry today. This is a report that was published by the World Health Organization. The equity, 1.2 billion people. 1.2 billion people. And if you were to look at how many of them are Muslim countries, approximately 760 million. Are you saying Allah is not going to ask us about this? Are you saying that this is not something we need to f feel empathy for? Absolutely. It is for this reason why Allah ordained us to stay away from food. So that we don't forget these people and what they go through every single day. Ikhwati, what is worse than being hungry is the loss of dignity. The fact that a person, a father, has to lower, lower himself in front of his family because he cannot provide food for them. And because a mother feels treacherous about betraying the trust of her children that she has no breast milk to provide for her children. Ikhwati, Allah does not want us to forget these people, so he's given us the month of Ramadan to stay away from food. And another one more group of people, and they are the ones who society totally forgets because they are not spoken about. Because they are not in front of our eyes and no one speaks about them. Who are these people? They are the prisoners. The prisoners that are languishing in prisons. 
who will not have access to their families and the families will not see them for years on end. It is for this reason why Allah tells us to stay away from our wives and our wives to stay away from the husbands in the months of Ramadan. Totally even by itikaf as well on the last 10 days. Ikhwati, all of this so that we might remember the prisoners who have to stay away from their families for years or end. My brothers and sisters of Islam, month of Ramadan is a month of remembering those people who are lesser than us. It is a month of humbling ourselves. It is a month of knowing that truly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only remembered when we remember the luxuries and the blessings that Allah has given us. When you forget the luxuries and the blessings Allah has given us, that is when you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, for the first time in the world, do you know how many Muslims there are? In the history of mankind, there has not been that many number of Muslims that, that call themselves Muslims. At least we don't know whether they truly are or not. 1.5 billion people, one in five is a Muslim. But do you know that one in four is an atheist today? One in four is an atheist today. One in four, 24.6%. As the United Nations counted the number of people worldwide who do not attribute themselves to any religion at all. One in four people are an atheist today, more than Muslims. Do you know why? Because Muslims are not doing their jobs. The reason why they're atheist ikhwati is because the dunya has engulfed them. When you go to the shop, you find 20 different types of bread to buy and 16 different types of drink that you can drink. You don't need Allah anymore in your life. You can pick up the phone and a pizza delivered. You can go on the line, you can go online, you can buy cotton from Egypt, you can buy China from China. Yekhwati, it's amazing. The life that we lead today, we have no need for God. It is for this reason why, my brothers and sisters of Islam, Allah gave us Ramadan so we remember God. Because, wallahi, how easy is it for us to forget that we are so close to poverty, so close to being hungry and going hungry. And it is for this reason why Allah gave us Ramadan so that we stay away from food and we stay away from our families. My brothers and sisters of Islam, the month of Ramadan is the month of tremendous sadaqah and charity. The month of tremendous sadaqah and charity. There are very few months in the calendar where a believer's heart is as soft and attached to Allah and to the Akhirah as much as Ramadan. It is for this reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains that we choose the Akhirah over this dunya. For this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained Ramadan to be a month of sadaqah and charity as well. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ajwad al-Nas said, said Ibn Abbas, Verily the Prophet used to be the most charitable of people. Wa kana ajwadu ma yakunu fi Ramadan, hina yalqahu Jibreel, fayudarisuhu al-Qur'an. When Jibreel used to meet him and, to te- and used to teach him the Qur'an. Ya ikhwati, my brothers and sisters Islam, do you know the reason why the Prophet was charitable in Ramadan? The hadith explains it. The hadith says, وَكَانَ أَجْوَدُ مَا يَكُونُ فِي رَمَضَانِ حِينَ يَلْقَاهُ جِبْرِيلِ فَيُدَارِسُهُ الْقُرْآنِ This part is usually forgotten by the people who explain this hadith. Ya Akhwati, one of the reasons why Rasulullah was so charitable in month of Ramadan is because he was revising the Qur'an. If you forget the Qur'an, this is a great musibah. If you remember the Qur'an, it is hidayah and nur for you in this dunya and the akhirah. Ya ikhwati, our teacher, may Allah have mercy upon him, Shaykh Shanqiti Hafidahullah in Medina, used to say, do not come to my class except that you give some sadaqah. Do not come to my class except that you give some sadaqah. Why? Because, ya ikhwati, this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu He used to give sadaqah, more sadaqah in Ramadan because he used to revise the Qur'an with Jibreel. He didn't want to forget the Qur'an. So there's a reason why today we, do, we gain knowledge or we learn the hadith or ayat or we memorize parts of the Qur'an that we forget it. Do you know why? Because you don't earn, don't earn Allah's good pleasure by giving sadaqah. Ya ikhwati, this was one of the ways by which you keep knowledge firm upon you. Ibn Qayyim says, there are nine steps to keeping knowledge firm in your heart. Number one is learning. Number two is practicing. Number three is teaching. Number four is sadaqah. Number four is sadaqah. Why? Because وَيَزِيدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ هُدَىٰ Allah increases the huda of those people who have already chosen, who have already chosen the huda. 
If you choose the huda, Allah will give you more huda. If you practice the huda that has already come to you, then Allah will give you more huda. There's a reason why we learn so many things, it doesn't stay in the hearts. That's because we don't give sadaqah and charity to keep the huda in our hearts. My brothers and sisters Islam, Yaqul ibn Qayyim rahimullah in his books, he says, in one of his books, he says, I used to see Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah giving sadaqah before every single salah at the time of coming out. He's coming out, come out of his house and he would give sadaqah every single time. So I asked my Shaykh, Ya Shaykh, why do you give sadaqah every time you come out to, to pray? Why do you give sadaqah? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions 27 times, wa aqimu salah wa atu zakah, prayer and sadaqah together. Prayer and sadaqah together, 27 times. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha najaytumu al-rasoola, faqaddimu bayna yaday najwaakum sadaqah. Or you who believe when you go to seek the counsel of the Prophet ﷺ on an affair, on a matter, then give money, give sadaqah before you go see him. So if we are meant to give sadaqah and money before we go see Rasulullah ﷺ, then to meet Allah in our salah, it is more worthy that we give sadaqah. It is more worthy that we give sadaqah. What a beautiful understanding Ibn Taymiyyah had. Ya khuti, ever since I understood that, Every single time I come for salah, I used to give sadaqah. And this is one of the beautiful things I used to love about Arab countries. When I used to live in Medina, is there were poor people everywhere. There was a poor person cleaning the streets, someone poor next to the road who is hungry or thirsty. There's so many people you can help, Ya And before you think, my brothers and sisters of Islam, before you think that your salah in Ramadan, which you are going to pray more, carefully and even more salawat in Ramadan is going to be accepted how do you accept all of these tarawees and all your qiyam al-layls and all your prayer in the masajid in Ramadan to be accepted without sadaqah it's not possible not possible ikhwani so you want to increase in guidance take the guidance of Allah azawajal and give sadaqah in the month of Ramadan and remember that your sadaqah will ensure that your salah is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters of Islam, sadaqah comes from the word sidq. Why? Because sadaqah is a sign of sidq, a sign of truthfulness of your love for your brother. Also, sadaqah is a sign of your love for the akhirah rather than this dunya. Because you are siddiq, you are sadiq in your hubb al-akhira min hubb al-dunya. And that is why sadaqah is called sadaqah. Ya khuti, in Surah Munafiqoon, in verse number 10 of Surah Munafiqoon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse. Do you know what that verse is? Ya ayyuhal ladheena aman. So Allah subhanahu wa calls out to, to those who believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Surah Munafiqoon, tells us about the munafiqoon, those who deceive you. In verse number 10, he refers to the believers and he says, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَصَّدَّقْ وَأَكُنْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ What does he say? He says, O oh Allah, Allah, Allah says, O oh, oh human beings, O oh Muslims, O oh people, give in charity. Before the day comes when you pass away, when you die. Yeah? Before the day comes when you die. And at the moment of death, you will call out to Allah and say, Oh Allah, give me five more minutes. Give me a few more minutes. Just hold on. Oh angel of death, let me go and do something. Do what? So that I may go back to this life. And the first thing I will do is not pray. First thing I will do is not, not go for hajj. First thing I will do is not say salam to my children. The first thing I will do is give sadaqah. This is why in the authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ, it's reported that on the day of judgment, no one from, from us, no one from the human beings and jinn, except that we will come to Allah on our own, one by one. 
and we will speak to Allah without any interpreter. At the moment of speaking to Allah without any interpreter, the hadith states, this hadith, you know the hadith, but people only mention the last part of the hadith, not the first part. The last part of the hadith says, save yourselves from the fire even if it be with half a date. You know the hadith? Have you heard of that? Right, it's there everywhere. Everyone puts it on a poster saying, please give us for this masjid, that masjid, or this orphan, that orphan, right? Well, let me tell you the full hadith. The full hadith is this. There is no one here except that you will speak to Allah one by one without any interpreter. You will see Allah above you. To your right will be Jahannam. To your left will be Jahannam. In front of you will be the Sirat over Jahannam. So save yourselves from the fire, even if it be with half a date. It is for this reason why some of the scholars of Islam, they used to say to their wives, O Umm Umar, this is Abu Umar, one of the scholars of Islam, he used to say to Umm Umar, his wife, O Umm Umar, give a lot of sadaqah and prepare yourselves for the journey over the bridge. The bridge is very long. The bridge over Jahannam is very long, ya khuti. My brothers and sisters of Islam, I summarized for you so that you go back with some true benefit from this lecture, 20 benefits of sadaqah that I, I can gather from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu and from the verses of the Quran. Let me tell you what these 20 benefits, benefits are so that bi'idhnillah, it serves as a reminder and something to uh, inshallah ta'ala motivate us to be of those people who are from the most generous of people uh, in this month of Ramadan bi'idhnillah. First is that when you give sadaqah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your sadaqah, your reward, 10 to 700 times. It is the highest multiplication you can find. Ya khuti, when you have an investment in a stock, in a stock market, for example, and then it suddenly goes up very high, right? Suddenly something happens, bam, it goes up very high. And then, mashallah, you make 10 times, 20 times the money that you originally invested. Do you know, you'll be, first of all, you'll be happy, but then, secondly, you'll be very sad. It's amazing. People who invest in the stock market, they're always happy and sad. Okay, why are they happy and sad? First, they're happy because the money went up. Sad because they didn't invest even more. They wish they invested even more. So when you see on the Day of Judgment, your money has gone up between 10 to 700 times. That one small dollar now is 10 to 700 times. You will wish you invested a lot more, ya khuti. And this is the first benefit of sadaqah. Number two, the second benefit of sadaqah is that when you help people in this dunya, you become from the merciful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, the Prophet said, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhumullah, irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Those who are merciful, Allah will have mercy on them. Have mercy, mercy on the people of this earth. The one above the heavens will have mercy on you. So by giving sadaqah, you become from the merciful that Allah, the, the, the most merciful, will have mercy on you. Number three, through sadaqah, you give a sadaqah, a charity for every single joint in your body. There is no single joint in your body except that you have sadaqah due from you every single day. In the authentic hadith, it is reported that two angels come down and say, Oh Allah, aati munfiqan khalafa. And the other one says, Oh Allah, aati mumsikan talafa. First one says, Oh Allah, give the one who gives in your cause more money. The other one says, Oh Allah, give the one who withholds from your cause destruction in his wealth. Do you know guys, brothers and sisters in Islam, the Islamic strategy for getting rich is very different to the non-Islamic strategy for getting rich. What is the non-Islamic strategy for getting, for getting rich? This is what the non-Islamic strategy is for getting rich. Let me summarize it for you. Uh, don't get married. Get married very late after you made a lot of money. Spread out your investments. Some in the real estate, some in the stocks. Make sure you diversify your investments. Okay? Don't go for Hajj right now. Because it's $10,000. Go later on. Once you... <laughs> Look, these children are laughing in front of me. Okay, don't go, for, don't go for Hajj right now. Go for Hajj later on. Because Hajj is very expensive. You're going to waste your money right now. Go invest it. The earlier you invest your money, the more you'll make, right? This is 
Oh, of course, and by the way, don't give too much char charity. If you give too much charity, you won't make enough money. Right? This is the typical investment advice for getting rich in this dunya. Is that not so? But look at the Islamic advice. Let me tell you some hadith. It's so funny. Because when you read the hadith of Rasulullah how to get rich, it's the exact opposite. In the authentic hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet said, whoever wants to get rich, let him get married. What the? Getting married is an expensive exercise. But the Prophet said, whoever wants to get rich, get married. There's a reason why we are, we are so poor these days. We only have one wife, guys. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer. <you> know. <laughs> it's true. Subhanallah. If you want to get rich, get married. It's a hadith of Rasulullah Not an authentic hadith, which is in Mustad Imam Ahmed. The Prophet said, whoever wants to get rich, let him do hajj. What? I thought hajj is $10,000. How can you get rich? But subhanallah, every time you do it, Allah has promised more money back. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Also, in the authentic hadith, the Prophet said, said, uh, uh, he said, whoever gives sadaqah, Allah will return it many fold. Yeah? Whoever gives sadaqah, Allah gives barakah in his wealth. Whoever gives sadaqah, Allah makes him more wealthier. And ma, ma naqasa malu min sadaqah, authentic hadith in Bukhari. Wealth is never decreased by sadaqah. So can you see how it's the exact opposite? Islamic strategy for getting rich is the total opposite of what we think today is the strategy of getting rich. So my brothers and sisters of Islam, remember this, that the third benefit of sadaqah is that you're giving a charity on behalf of every single joint in your body, which is due from you every single day. Number four, Sadaqah and giving charity is a sign of your love for your brother and you will not enter Jannah until you Believe and you will never believe until you love each other for the sake of Allah That hadith is authentic. It's in Bukhari. So how can you love each other? Well by giving gifts to each other and giving Sadaqah to the poor you end up loving the poor and they end up loving you And so as a result Sadaqah is a means of loving your brother which will lead to Iman Which will lead to entry into Jannah insha'Allah Point number five, by giving sadaqah, you are helping your brother. And when you are helping your brother, the Prophet said, Allah's help is assured for you. He said in authentic hadith in Bukhari, Inna Allah fi awni al-abd ma kana al-abd fi awni akhi. Verily Allah helps his brother as long as a Muslim, as long as the Muslim helps his brother. You want Allah's help? You want Allah to fix your problems? Then give sadaqah. It's the surest way to know Allah will answer your dua and will help you in your cause. Number six, by giving in charity, you are protecting and preserving Allah's deen and helping Allah. When you do that, then you are assured of Allah's help as well. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in tansurullaha yansurukum. If you help Allah, Allah will help you back. So how are you helping Allah? You're helping His deen through sadaqah. So as a result, Allah will help you back in this dunya by protecting you in the akhirah, by saving you from the punishment of the grave and from the adab al-qabr and jahannam. Number seven, by giving in sadaqah, you are attaining a higher position of righteousness. You are attaining the status of al-birr, which is the highest level of ihsan. Why is that? Because money is something we love. And so we cannot attain the highest level of righteousness until we give that which we love. It is for this reason why Allah says in the Quran, Lan tanalu al birra hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. Meaning you can't be from the highest people. You can't be from the Ashab al yameen and Sabiqeen wal Muqarrabeen. You can't be from the people from Ashab al Firdaus until you give that which you, this, that which you love the most. Give away that which you love the most, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is this dunya. Ya khwati, this dunya is called dunya, it comes, comes from the word dana, which means to come close. So no doubt we love it a lot. But the real test is to give it away for the cause of Allah Azzawajal and to not be attached to it. Ya khwati, number eight, point number eight. Sadaqah extinguishes the anger of Allah, just like water extinguishes the fire. Authentic hadith in Tabarani. Is there anyone here who has a guarantee that Allah is not angry with him? Anyone here who is sure that he is not doing something or the other to make Allah angry with him? 
Ya khuti, no one has that guarantee. It is for this reason why sadaqah is so important. So we extinguish, extinguish the anger of Allah Azzawajal about us. Number nine, sadaqah defends us on the grave and sadaqah will defend us on the day of judgment. In the authentic hadith, the Prophet said, sadaqah will come in the form of a knight, in the form of a soldier, a knight, who will defend you in your grave from all the punishment of Allah in your grave. In the authentic hadith, it also says that sadaqah will come in the form of a witness on the day of judgment who will witness on the day of judgment for you. Number 10, by the amount of sadaqah is the amount of your shade on the day of judgment. Ya khwati, wallahi, I got out in the airport today and I was burnt. I'm actually very fair, I'm a very fair human being. But today I was burnt because the Qatari sun is so hot. La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah, they say it was what? 49 degrees today. I am sure it was probably 59 degrees, ya akhi. It is so hot in Qatar, isn't it? Amazing. Sorry? No? Adi. <laughs> La ilaha illallah. That's an exaggeration. So, Allah mustaan. Ya salam. Imagine 50,000 years of standing in the heat of the sun. And the sun, as the Prophet explained, will be one meal. The scholar said meal can mean two things. One mile or one comb length, which is a meal in Arabic, which is 10 centimeters. Only Allah knows how far the sun will be above our heads. On that day, ya khuti, we will be, we will be raised up naked and uncircumcised, barefooted. Can you imagine standing in that heat? We want shade on that day, ya khuti. Our shade will be the amount of sadaqah that we have given in this dunya. Al-mar'u fi dhilli sadaqatihi yawm al-qiyamah. Verily a person will be in the, in the amount of his shade on the day of judgment, authentic hadith in Bukhari. Ya ikhwati, point number 11. Sadaqa, through sadaqa, you protect your progeny and your children from harm. When you give sadaqa, you're actually protecting your children. When I give sadaqa, I'm protecting my children. How is that? Because the true protection is a protection from Allah Azzawajal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not protect our children when we are not there or we are dead except by us becoming righteous. When we become righteous, Allah will be kind and merciful to our children. When we are bad, Allah will let our children go astray. What is the proof of that? The proof of that is in Surah Kahf. The third person that Khidr, the third thing that Khidr did with Musa, what was it? Ali salam. What was the third thing he did with Musa? The third thing was that there was a, a wall that was about to fall. And so Khidr fixed the wall, right? Salam, he fixed the wall and he didn't take uh, money for it. So Musa salam, asked him, why didn't you uh, get some cash for it? Uh, why did you do it for free? So Ikhwati, uh, Khidr lost his patience at that point, as you know. And he told him why. The reason was, فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانَ تَحْتَهُ كَنْزٌ لَهُمَا As for the, the wall that was about to fall, it used to belong to two orphans in the village and underneath the wall was their treasure. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا And their father was a righteous man. فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَيَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا So Allah wanted that when they become pubert and adults, and then Allah will bring the treasure out as a mercy from Allah for them, so they have money. Ibn Abbas said in the tafsir of this verse, he said what? He said Allah wanted good for the orphans because of the righteousness of the father. La ilaha illallah. So when you are good to human beings, when you are good to other Muslimin, Allah will consider you righteous that will protect your children. You want to protect your children? What do we do today when we try to protect our children? We say, oh, I have to build a second home for them, a third home, then it becomes a fourth one. And then they start having babies and then khalas, you have to now build for their grandchildren. Don't do that. Don't do that because your children will never treat your wealth like they treat their wealth. Mark my words, what I'm telling you. My iPad is scratched and never charged. 
My son's iPad is beautiful, there's no scratches, and it's always charged. When I ask Yusuf, Yusuf, why is your iPad better than my one? He said, I don't know. Yes, you do know. Because you care for your wealth more than you care for my wealth. Yeah, when he shuts the door of my car, poof, Yusuf, oops, sorry, dad. I said, what do you mean, sorry, dad? If it was your car, would you smash the door that hard? Yeah, khwati, they will never treat your wealth like they treat their wealth. Mark my words. Do not be of those people who say, oh, I'm going to leave this for my children. Are you crazy? You want to leave them for your children? Give them a good education. Marry them to good people. And then let them fend for themselves. Leave them small amounts of money. Let them fend for themselves. Rest, give it to Allah. Give it to Allah. وَآتُوهُمْ مِنْ مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَعْطَاكُمْ Give to charity from the wealth of Allah that Allah has given you. Don't be foolish. Don't leave that much wealth for your children. They don't need it. How many of us from the Indian Pakistani subcontinent brothers and sisters over here in the audience know people who have yet to divide up the inheritance of their dead relatives back home? They have yet to do it. Have you all divided up their inheritance? They have so much inheritance still due. But you don't care for it because you live in Qatar. You want to build a home in Malaysia. You want to build a home in Qatar. You don't want to build a home back in Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. You don't. So you don't care much for the wealth that your grandparents left back in the village. You don't even divide it up just to show you how useless wealth is. Leaving it just for the kids. Rather leave it for Allah. Leave it for Allah. Give it to Allah's cause. It will be for you on the day of judgment. I've forgotten count, but I think it's number 12 now. Is that right? Number 12. The authentic hadith in Mustad Imam Ahmed, the Prophet Wasallam said, the best of you are the ones who are the most beneficial to humanity. The best of you are the ones who are the most beneficial to humanity. When you give sadaqah, you become beneficial to humanity. It is for this reason why the scholars of Islam, as mentioned by Nawawi Rahimullah says in Al-Majmu', the ulama of Islam have complete ijma' that the rich worshipper of Allah is better than the poor worshipper of Allah. Why? Because the rich worshipper of Allah, he gives sadaqah and, and he gives money away. Whereas the poor worshipper of Allah cannot benefit anyone but himself. Number 13. <clears throat> when you give sadaqah, you are actually leaving the money for yourself in the future. When you give sadaqah, you're leaving it for the future. Ya khuti, why leave money for yourself in the future? And how do you do so? In the authentic narration, it is reported that the Prophet ﷺ came to see Aisha and Aisha had slaughtered a sheep. And she gave some of the sheep away for sadaqah. She gave three-fourths of the sheep away and kept only one leg. So the Prophet ﷺ came and said, how much of the sheep have you, have we got left? He said, oh, we only have one leg left. So Rasulullah said, no, ya Aisha, we have three-fourths of the sheep left. He said, we have three-fourths of the sheep left. And this is why the Prophet used to say, Ayyukum malu warithihi ahabbu ilayhi min mali. Who is there amongst you who loves the wealth of his inheritors more than his own wealth? He said, Ya Rasulullah, there's no one except that loves his own wealth than the wealth of his inheritors. He said, that which you give in the cause of Allah is your wealth. That which you leave behind is the wealth of your inheritors. Ya khuti, don't wait for the last day to give your sadaqah. Give it away. You know, a few days ago, a few months ago, I was in Mecca. I went to see Masjid al-Rajihi, which was just recently completed. One of the largest masjid in Mecca, or the largest masjid in Mecca right after the Haram. The Haram of Mecca. Al-Rajihi, Sulaiman al-Rajihi, had over 13.1 billion US dollars in wealth. Do you know this man doesn't even have 13 dollars to his name now? He has distributed his wealth away. He wants to die being raised up with the masakin. 13.1. If he has the courage to give 13.1 billion dollars away whilst he's still alive, before he dies, why do you not have the courage to give your house away, your car away? Why are you so uh, miserly with your wealth? Why? 
If he has the courage to give far, he is far more wealthy than all of us put together. He had the courage to give all of that away. Why do we not have the courage to give our wealth away, Ikhwani? Something's wrong, Ikhwani. Something's wrong. And what's wrong is the heart. And that's why Allah has given us Ramadan. Fix this thing. Fix this thing. This is deceiving us. Fix the hearts. It is deceiving us. Yekhwati, point number whatever, 14. Sadaqa is a sign of tawakkul. Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah, he says, he says, tawakkul is half of iman. And he also said, it is half of Islam. Tawakkul is half of Islam. Half of Islam. Because tawakkul means having good thoughts about Allah. And how do you attain tawakkul? You attain it by relying on Allah, not on what is in your pocket. And that is why the scholars of Islam said, he said, tawakkul is to think that that which is with Allah is more certain than, that, than the money in your own pocket. So you're certain that Allah will help you. You're certain that Allah will pay for it, rather than you will pay for it with the money in your pocket. This is true tawakkul, ya khwani. And to attain tawakkul, completeness of your iman, perfection of your Islam, it can only happen, ya ikhwani, through giving sadaqah. Number 15, by giving sadaqah, not only do you get the reward of sadaqah, you actually get the reward of whatever the person uses the money for. So imagine the person uses the money to buy books through which he helps new Muslims accept, uh, non-Muslims accept Islam. That means not only do you get the reward of sadaqah, but you get the reward of someone accepting Islam. Imagine through that sadaqah, that person has bought food through which he's breaking his fast. So not only do you get the reward of sadaqah, you get the reward of the person's fast as well. Amazing, isn't it? And if that person ends up using it in something that gives recurring reward, then you get reward for that recurring until the day of judgment. Number 16, sadaqah is the truest meaning of jariyah. Sadaqah is the jariyah. Sadaqatun jariyah, we say that, right? We say sadaqatun jariyah. Sadaqatun jariyah, the truest sadaqah jariyah is sadaqah itself. Because when you give sadaqah, money, charity away, then that is usually used in something that benefits human beings for many, many years, or benefits knowledge, or benefits an infrastructure project. And so as a result, it is the true meaning of jariya. It will benefit you even in your graves and for many years to come. Number 17, and in the authentic hadith, the Ikhwani, in the authentic hadith, number 17, let's carry on. Number 17, uh, the, the Prophet said, uh, the, the scholars of Islam said, that sadaqah is more rewarding than all other nafal deeds other than gaining knowledge. Sadaqah is more beneficial than all other nafal deeds other than gaining knowledge. The reason why is because it benefits others, not only yourself. Number 18, the only reason they said gaining knowledge is more beneficial than sadaqah is because knowledge tells you the benefit of sadaqah. Sadaqah doesn't tell you the benefit of knowledge. And so that which points to something is better than the one. That which points to something is better than that. That's why the scholars say the scholars are better than mujahideen. Why? Because the scholars tell the mujahideen to do jihad, not the jihad tells the scholars to seek knowledge. Correct? So as a result, ulama are better than mujahideen. Number 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes charity to grow until even a small date becomes like mountain of Uhud on the day of judgment in reward. The Prophet said in authentic hadith in Tabarani and Musta Imam Ahmed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a single date that you give in sadaqah and he nurtures it, nurtures it, grows it, grows it, grows it until you come on the day of judgment, one single date will be like the mountain of Uhud in reward, subhanallah. Number 19, by giving sadaqah, you become from the poor people. By giving sadaqah, you become from the people who are eligible to be raised with the poor on the day of judgment. In the authentic hadith in Tabarani, the Prophet ﷺ said the rich people will be the lowest human beings on the day of judgment. Lowest of the low. Lowest trash on the day of judgment. Rich. The richer you are, the lowest trash you will be on the day of judgment. Except for the ones who gave sadaqah. Authentic hadith in Tabarani. So perhaps you're thinking, oh, it's okay, I've just got a small job. I get 
10,000 dinars, uh, 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 rials. I'm not, I'm not rich. Are you joking? You must be joking. Do you have a bank account? Okay, let, let me ask this question. Other than the children who don't have bank accounts, who in this audience does not have a bank account? Anyone? No, everyone has a bank account. If you have a bank account, you're already rich because only 13% of the world population has a bank account. Correct? You're already rich. You're already from the top 13%. So don't fool yourself. Yekhwani, my brothers and sisters, we are in trouble unless we give sadaqah. Otherwise, we'll be trampled on the day of judgment. We'll be the lowest on the day of judgment. And, ya salam, ya khwati, there's a statement of Al-Hassan al-Basri I have to tell you. Al-Hassan al-Basri was asked this question, Oh Al-Hassan, why don't you want to be rich? Okay? Why don't you want to be rich? So Al-Hassan al-Basri said, If the money that I earn is haram, then fear the fire, fear Jahannam. And if the money is halal that I'm earning, then fear the questioning. Fear the questioning on the Day of Judgment. Questioning, Yahwani, is very severe. The scholars, the hadith, the scholars commented on the hadith of Rasulullah that says that the, that the poor will enter Jannah by 500 years before the rich. You know the hadith that says that? They commented on the hadith and said the reason why is because of the severe questioning. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ then you'll be asked about the Naim. Every single Riyal will be asked about. Every single Riyal. What did you do with that Riyal? Why? What gave you the right to do that? Every single Riyal, ya akhwani. Thumma latus'alunna anil Naim. If we did one atoms of good, we will see it. One atoms of weight, we will see it. That's why. Fear the questioning. If your money is halal, which I hope it is all, inshaAllah. Fear the questioning, Ikhwani. Number 20, I guess. Is that right? Number 20. The most important of all. To give sadaqah is to follow the sunnah Muhammad Sallallahu If you love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you'll be like him. He was the most giving in Ramadan. So we must be like him. Ikhwati in one narration. Just to give you an example of how much he gave. A man came to his tribe, yeah? And he said, Ya qawmi, ya qawmi. It's authentic hadith in Bukhari. He said, Ya qawmi, oh my people, oh my people. Aslimu, aslimu, accept Islam, accept Islam. The people said, why are you telling us all to accept Islam? He said, Aslimu, aslimu, fa inna muhammadin yu'ti ata'a rajulin la yakshal faqar. For verily, Muhammad Wasallam gives the giving of a man, he doesn't fear poverty. Even though he's so poor, he doesn't fear poverty. What's the proof? The proof was that this man, messenger came from a tribe to see the Prophet ﷺ. And before he left to go back to his tribe, the Prophet ﷺ gave him a valley of sheep. A valley full of sheep. This is whilst the Prophet had nothing to eat except the two black things, dates and water. My brother, this is Islam. This is true tawakkul. This is how a Prophet was. He gave like there was no tomorrow. He gave like a man who did not wait for tomorrow. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ finished his Isha, moved away, went home straight away, then he came back. Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? You didn't even make good dhikr, you went away. And you came back, he said, I remembered one dinar, one gold coin that I had near my bed. It had fallen off from my pocket. Someone had given me a gift and I did not want to wait a single second until I'd given it away. This is the person we are following, Ya khwani. This is the person we are following, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most charitable of all human beings. If he can, be, can, can do this without fearing poverty, if Suleiman al rajihi can do this without fearing poverty, if Warren Buffett can do this, 99% of his wealth is given away without fearing poverty. If Bill Gates can do this, non-Muslims can do this, why can't Muslimin? Ya khwati, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something at the end of my talk today. We want the Ummah to rise again. We want Izzah and glory back again. We want to stop all the fitna, all the troubles happening again. Then we've got to, we've got to start with ourselves. 
We want one generation of human beings, one generation of Muslims, this Ummah, the 21st century generation of Muslims, one generation of Abu Bakrs and Umars, those who give 50% of the wealth away, those who give 100% of the wealth away. If we can have this, then we, we are, I, I mean, I am certain that this Ummah will, will rise up again. There is so much khair to be done, and in the khair, there's not enough money to be done. Let me tell you how easy it is to solve the problems of the world. Do you know that in a report that was published recently by a consortium of charities in UK, I was flabbergasted with this report, amazing. In a consortium of charities in UK, they published a report. This is Oxfam UK published a report that said to end world poverty, poverty, yeah? What's poverty? Poverty is where you don't have food, don't have clean water, education, and uh, a house, yeah? So to end world poverty, how much money do you need? Worldwide, Africa, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, everywhere where there was poverty, right? You want to end it? How much money do you need? They said 60 billion US dollars. Oh, that's a lot of money. 60 billion. But here is the facts. The fact is, the top 100 people last year, the top 100 richest people last year, just the profits, not the capital, just the profits of the investments was $240 billion. If they gave 25% of their money away, we could end world poverty. La ilaha illallah. My brothers and sisters Islam, wallahi, we are very selfish. My brothers and sisters Islam, we are very selfish people. Start with ourselves. Let us be the first people to prove to Allah Azza wa Jal, Ya Rabb, we're going to be like the Abu Bakrs and the Umars. We're going to give everything away, as much as we can, inshaAllah, and even more than that. And we know that that which is with you is more certain than that which is in our pocket. And we're going to follow the sunnah of our Habib, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this Ramadan. And we're going to become the new generation of Abu Bakrs and Umars that are going to re revive this Ummah, bi'idhnillah, one more time. Thank you to all my brothers and sisters for coming today. I hope to see you all tomorrow for the course that I'm delivering in Fanar. It starts at 8.30 in the morning, inshallah, which is the real deal uh, on, on business and finance and how to earn a halal income, inshallah ta'ala. Please try and attend. Don't lose out. Don't miss out. It will not be done here anytime soon from what I know. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, it is a very, very engaging, interesting course, inshallah. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhiru da'awana. And alhamdulillahi wa rabbil alameen.